may be seated, and if you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, and as you're turning there, I want to remind you of my theme scripture in Acts chapter 27. I'm preaching a series of messages on four anchors for the storms of life, and those four anchors, they are the cross, the Bible-based family, the church, and the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Tonight, I'm going to preach on the Bible-based family. This is the second item listed there. This morning, I preached on the first anchor, the cross. And uh, I'm doing this series of messages because we have some new converts here. And if you can get these four anchors in your life, you'll be able to make it through all the storms that will ever come your way. We did an entire series, 26 messages, Pastor Ricky and myself, on surviving the storms of life. They're out on, uh, you can go to our website. It's got a little button you can click in YouTube and it just take you right to the message and everything is edited out except for the preaching there. You can go to, to Facebook Live or live stream and you can see, have all the music and everything. But um, we want you to get the Word of God. Tonight I want to talk about the Bible-based family. Now, Paul in our 27th chapter of Acts, he was in a great storm. And they hadn't seen the sun or the moon or the stars for days and looked like all hope was gone. And they cast out four anchors out of the stern and they wished for the day. That little ship was being tossed to and fro like a little tif toothpick and it was about to break to pieces. And the Bible says it looked like all hope was gone. The Bible says they fearing that they should be cast upon the rocks and become shipwrecked. They took these four anchors and cast them out. They cast out four anchors and every person on board that ship was saved. And I believe if you'll cast these four anchors out in your life, then you can make it and you can make it all the way to shore. They made it to the shore. We're, we're interested in making it to heaven's shore. So tonight we're talking about the anchors of life. And tonight I want to talk to you about the Bible-based family. It was God who instituted the family, and God has a divine order for the home. Now, this is totally different from the world that we live in. It's totally different from the culture. So I thank God for my Christian home. Amen. I thank God that I was brought up in a home where I understood divine order. And the home I grew up in, it was based on the Bible. And when I first got saved, I told my mother, I said, Mother, you know, the Bible says the man is the head of the home. She said, that's right, son, but don't ever forget this. The woman is the neck, and the neck can turn the head any way it wants to. <laughs> so my mother was a woman of great wisdom, and uh, she was a, a godly woman, and she was a prayer warrior. And when my mother prayed, I want to tell you, heaven listen. And mother used to read my mail. And she would tell me, son, the Holy Ghost said this, and the Holy Ghost said that. And she knew exactly what I was doing, even though she was at home. And I was out. Well, I was just out there, okay? <laughs> so we're talking about the anchors of life and the family. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 5. This is God's order for the home. Some of you, you've had... Uh, broken homes, broken lives, fragmented, you're hurting, and you've got family, but you're not with that family right now. Well, you still have family, and that means that this order will help you. Uh, some of you have children that they uh, are grown and gone, and you need to treat your children the way the Bible says to treat them. Even though they're gone out of your sight, there is an order. So Ephesians 5, 21, this is talking about the husband and the wife. It says, submitting yourself to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband. Look at this, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. As the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be subject to their husband. Now, I know that our culture does not teach that, but I'm teaching what the Bible has to say. Now, look at verse 25. Husbands, 
Love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And that's a pretty tall order right there that I have to give myself for my family. I'll never forget my little 66 Corvette. It was a classic. It had 43,000 actual miles on it. And when my family was growing up, my kids come along and we needed a nice automobile. So I took my little Corvette and I invested it in a nice Mercedes Benz. And it was about five years ago, I think I unwrapped that car, that Corvette. I told my wife, I said, the kids are grown, they're gone, they're all on their own, they're not on my payroll anymore, praise God for that, they've all got a good college education, they all have careers, and they're not on my payroll, and I just praise God for that, but I unwrapped that car, but what I had to do was to give myself and give up some of the desires that I had for my family, and that's what it is, and that's what the Bible talks about in a godly home and a godly order. Verse 25, husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and also gave himself for it. Look at this, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives, even as they are own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself so god says just like i want a holy church i want a holy family i want everything in a divine order because i instituted the family i'm the one that did it and i have a certain order for it now let's look at ephesians 6 and 1 because i taught all of my children this i'm teaching my grandchildren now little anderson that's a three dollar scripture I gave him $3 to memorize this scripture. Ephesians 6, 1, 2, and 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And look at verse 4. And you fathers, talking about the children, provoke not your children to raft, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I want to talk to you about the second anchor tonight, the Bible-based family. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the music tonight, for your presence here. And Lord, speak to us right out of your word, right out of your heart, Lord. Speak through these lips of clay. Give us, Lord, understanding. And where we've made mistakes, God, and we all have, help us, Lord, to get things in divine order and to get our homes, Lord, in the order that you have purposed for the family. Bless us tonight, and everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, God has a divine order for the family, and it was God who instituted the family. Before the church, before anything else, God instituted the family. A man and a woman, a family. And Satan came to destroy that family. And today he is still attacking families. He is still attacking the institution of marriage. And there's a storm going on in our culture right now. And we've got legislators and they're trying to redefine the family. They're trying to redefine marriage. God the Father instituted the family. God the creator of all things decided long ago that a family should consist of a man and a woman. And a man and a woman that they should have children. And they should bring them up in the ways of God. The word father in the Bible, it means he who decides. Now, so God the father, he who decides, he made a man and he made you a man if you're a man. God made a man a man and God made a woman a woman. The problem is our society has tried to redefine a man as someone who pumps iron all the time, someone who curses, someone who drinks liquor, someone who sleeps around with as many women as he can. Now, look at Hollywood today. Look at the movie industry. Look at the mess that those people are in. So you don't have to do much reasoning to know that they don't know a thing about how to have a home and how to have a family. Their lives are falling apart. But when God created you, he created you a man 
if you are a man, and sleeping around, it does not prove that you are a man. Our culture tries to promote that. The movie industry tries to promote that, but that is not true. It only proves, if you're sleeping around, that the devil has control of your flesh. It does not prove that you're a man. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of destruction. And God wants us to live our lives in such a manner that our lives are rich. They are blessed. Uh, put Psalms 23 and 1 up there if you would, brother. Most people know this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. David was a shepherd. I preached two sermons on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I felt after that first sermon, I didn't explain lordship well enough even though i used a lot of scripture i said god i just don't feel like i got that point over and i heard the holy ghost whisper to me look at that the lord is my shepherd i shall not want i heard the holy ghost whisper to me the shepherd is my lord i shall not want the good shepherd he's my lord and therefore i shall not want if you want to pick it up, there are 24 covenant blessings that they're on the, the welk table at the Welcome Center. And it gives you 20, 12 covenant rights that you have as a child of God if you will come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. So God made a man a man. God made a woman a woman. And when God created you, he gave you the plumbing he desired for you to have. Amen. So we need to get back to morality. We need to get back to what the Bible calls a man. And the Bible says the blessed man does not walk in the way of the sinner. He delights in the law of the Lord. If you would put Psalms 1 up there, I want, I want you to just, just see what the blessed man does. Because Psalms 1 verses 1 through 6, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So I want you to see the downward progression of sin. A man starts out walking in the counsel of the ungodly, then he stands with sinners, and the next thing you know, he sit down with them, and he's doing and endorsing what they do. The blessed man does not do those things. The blessed man, look at verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And I love this. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And I love this part. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. And if the good shepherd is your Lord, I promise you, goodness and mercy they're on your trail. They will hunt you down. You won't be able to get away from them. Because when you come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, David said, The Lord is my shepherd, or the shepherd is my Lord. I shall not want. Paul said, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So when you come under the Lordship, most people don't understand the blood covenant. The blood covenant says, Everything I have belongs to God. And everything God has belongs to me. We're in a covenant. It's the strongest covenant there is. It goes way back into the ancient days, the blood covenant. If you broke that covenant, the family would hunt you down and kill you. That's what it, how sacred that covenant was. And we have a new and a better covenant. It's cut and established upon the, the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus cut a new covenant at Calvary. And when you come under his lordship, let me tell you, when you understand the cross, when you understand everything that you ever get will come from the cross, you're on your way to victory. Somebody go and praise God. Hallelujah. And then the family comes along. And you want your family to be a place, a home where there's refuge, where a place where can, you can go. Now look at uh, Psalms 1 and 4. It said, The ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff, chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment of sinners and the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. So the godly man, he is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He brings forth his fruit in his season, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. How many of you want to live a life like that? That everything you put your hands to, 
God blesses it. Well, when you come under lordship and you understand the lordship of Jesus Christ, then you can pray with confidence. You can claim those promised ble covenant blessings. And, and you can pray that effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman that availeth much. See, a man is a real man when he stands in a wicked world and he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. God decided I'm a man, and I am a man, and if God decided you're a woman, you're a woman. God made Adam, and then he gave him a helpmate called Eve. God made male and female, and God, he ordained marriage, and he ordained the family. Father, he who decides, he made you the way you are, so get happy about it. And don't be confused, amen, like the world is today. Don't be confused about who you are. Amen. If you have a womb, you're a woman. And, and if you have the plumbing of a man, you're a man. It's just that simple. So act like it. Don't be confused. They got this crazy thing. I, I was just looking on, on the Internet, and they call them not children anymore, but theas. It'll be thea. It'll be whatever I decide it will be once that we decide the characteristics it doesn't have any isn't the world crazy isn't that foolish my god taking little children and get them all mixed up like that when god says the blessed man walks in my ways the blessed man the blessed man does what i have to say he who decides made you the way you are hallelujah the problem is we live in a generation where certain people they want to redefine the family and this has become such an issue in our society that those that want to protect family values, that want to protect morality, that want legislation passed and want to have biblical terms, the world has decided that we're wrong. Well, let me tell you, God is not wrong. God has never been wrong. God is always right. His word is always right. And when God says, that shall not, that's God's way of saying, don't hurt yourself. When God says, do this, that's God's way of saying, do this so my blessings can overshadow you. Isn't God a great God? See, there's a storm brewing on the sea of life, and it has been directed at and headed toward the home and toward the family. But God's plan is the family. I want you to look at Ephesians 6 and 4. Ephesians 6 and 4. Once again, we read it earlier. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, let me preach a little while. It's coming right out of my heart. People say, the church is losing its young people. No, the truth is this. The church has no young people to lose because God has entrusted children to their parents. It's not the church who decides whether or not your children will come to church. It is not the church who decides whether or not you will have prayer or family devotion in your home. It's not the church that decides if your children will be brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It's not the church that decides what time your teenagers must be in at night. It's not the preacher who decides what TV programs your children will watch and what your kids cannot watch. The preacher does not decide the music that your kids listen to or the places that they go to. It does, he does not decide their attitudes. That's up to you to correct them, to bear not the rod. Amen. When they are acting wrong, don't take their side if they're wrong. Take the side of those in authority that are trying to put some balance and trying to put something in their life. The problem is you can't say anything to a kid now because the parents, they jump in and defend them. And it shouldn't be like that. The Bible says if it's right, then it's right. If it's wrong, then it's wrong. So let me preach a little more. The church does not decide who your people, who your children date either. Parents, who are you kidding? If your child is living in rebellion, don't blame the church and don't blame the government. And by, please don't blame the preacher. The Bible says, Father, <laughs> provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You see, the devil knows that if he can destroy the family, he knows he can destroy the society or the culture. 
God's plan is the family. And when Jesus came on the scene, he performed his first miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. And at the wedding of this young couple, this was Jesus' way of telling the devil, devil, you destroyed the first family, but I've come as the last Adam, and I've come to put things back in order once again. When Jesus shows up, let me tell you, Jesus changes things. He changed the water into wine. He said, I want there to be some joy in that marriage. I want there to be some peace there. I, I want this family to enjoy what I have created. And God is concerned about the family. Amen. When Jesus showed up at the wedding, they ran out of wine, but Jesus performed the miracle. He turned the water into wine. He is a God of miracles, and God has a miracle for you and for your family if you will stay under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and stay anchored to the cross. Hallelujah. When Jesus shows up at that wedding or anywhere else, he changes things. Not just a change, but some changes. When he comes, hallelujah, Jesus shows up in a person's life. And he brings miraculous changes. He brings supernatural changes. Some of you just come out of the club. Some of you come off of drugs. Some of you come out of alcohol. Some of you came out of all kind of stuff like I did. Hallelujah. Amen. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God showed up in my life. And God started changing some things. I, I've said it many times. I said, God, why is my life so messed up? All I'd ever heard preached out of uh, Galatians 6 and 7 was, Whatsoever man soweth, that shall also reap. And all I'd ever heard preached was, If you sin, you don't win, you're going to die and go to hell. But I said, God, why is my life so messed up? He said, Son, you've sown bad seed. He said, Sow to my word, and I will bless your life. Sow to my word, if God says, this is what you do, then do it. If you do want to be the blessed person, if you want your home blessed, become a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Don't let the devil tell you that you'll never meant anything. He tells everybody that. But praise God, I'm here to announce good news. Jesus Christ came that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. And if you fail, you don't have to be a failure. The only person that's a failure is the person that won't get up and try again. Praise God if you fall a thousand times. Get up and run to the cross. Hallelujah. The preaching of the cross is the power of God under salvation to everyone that believes. And God has a miracle. And he's got your name on it too, but you gotta claim it. You gotta go after God. Woo! I said you gotta go after it. Paul said, I'm in the press. I'm pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ, my Lord. The woman with the issue of blood, she got in the press. She pressed through that crowd. She said, if I can just touch him, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, praise God, I shall be made whole. And I'm here to tell you, you can be made whole. You don't have to fail. You don't have to live a life of failure. You are God's child. You're a king's kid. And you can make it because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. Somebody go on and praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Jesus performed his first miracle at a wedding. And God will perform miracles in your life and in your home and in your family. He's a good God. So what is God's idea of a real godly family. Well, a man and a woman, Christians, don't get unequally yoked. They fall in love, they get engaged, and they get married. Amen. Today, our society has thrown all that out the window, and Hollywood would tell us that doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be done in that order. But everything you see on TV says it's okay, just go ahead and cast morality to the wind. But that's not what God says. The Word says a man and a woman are to get married, and then they're to have children. I mean, our culture says it's all right. My wife tells me not to say shack up. I went to, into a house the other night, and, and I was a little shocked. And the person said, people shouldn't shack up. I said, people shouldn't shack up. Amen. Culture says it's all right. Just go on and live together. 
You'll get married someday. No, that's not the order. God's order is to date, fall in love, get married. And then after some planning, you better play in this thing. It costs to have children now. Do some good planning. And then have your family. And bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. God wants you to, your life to be blessed and, and, and to be happy. Amen. We're to build our homes on love with joy and peace in that home. And we're to train our children up to do the same thing. See, the, the home is a place where respect is to be taught. The home is a place where authority is to be taught and understood. The home is a place where morality is taught. It's a place where accountability is taught. It's a place where love is taught. What a wonderful season, Thanksgiving. I, I was so glad to see my family. You know, the family is a great, great blessing from God. Children are heritage of the Lord. And blessed is the man whose quiver is full. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I, 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 every time I look at my three children, I think about the mercy of God. That if I hadn't made it back from Vietnam, those three wouldn't be here. But God, who is rich in mercy, he was so good to me. Pulled me out of the jaws of death. Gave me my life. Saved me. And I've got six beautiful grandchildren. That's something to protect. That's something to cherish. That is something in our culture today. If you've got a family, go home and thank God. Thank him. I won't, that problem's in families. You know, Joseph had a dream. And he saw in the dream his brothers would bow down to him. His daddy gave him a coat of many colors. And Joseph, uh, he stood out. And they didn't like Joseph. And finally they put him in a pit and they sold him off. And he ends up in Potiphar's house down in Egypt. And his, the woman lives on him. He ends up in prison. But he goes from the pit to the palace. Hallelujah. He was the interpreter of dreams. God was with him. He, he got down there in that prison, and, and he was so industrious and worked so hard. He was so godly. And give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good enough for Daddy. It was good enough for Mama. It's good enough for me. And he's just cleaning the place up, getting all the rats out of there. And he does such a great job. So you can shine anywhere. You don't have to take what the world says. You don't have to be a failure. Put your hand in that nail-scarred hand and begin to walk with the king of kings. Hallelujah. And the next thing you know, he interprets the dream of the king. And you know the story. He, his brothers come and they bow down just like he saw in the dream. He was a dreamer. If you have a dream, you didn't manufacture that dream. God put that dream in your heart. God is the dream maker. Great it is to dream a dream when you're standing in youth by the starry stream. But a greater thing is to live life through and say at the end, Hallelujah, the dream came true. You've got a dream, go for it, praise God. Go for it, go for it with all of your might. Don't let people stop you, praise God. I had them try to stop me a thousand times, but I just keep on going. They try to keep me out of college. But I went to college and got me an education. Amen. Hallelujah. Worked 30 years in the business world. Had my own business. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ. But you can't lay around and just say, I can't do and I can't do this and I can't do that. And you can't wait for things to come. Sometimes you just got to make things happen. Hallelujah. Just get that spirit about you that I am going to achieve. I have a dream. And I'm going after my dream. Great it is to dream a dream. But a greater thing is to live life through. And say at the end, the dream. The dream came true. God is interested in the family. And your success, the success in your life, there are others that they are riding your coattail. They are connected. They are hooked up to you. And if you live your life in such a way that you fulfill your dreams, they will be able to achieve greater things than you. My daddy didn't have the education I have. My children, all of them, they have professions. 
They, they get, I worked my way through college on the GI Bill. They didn't pay for their college. Daddy did. And they got out of college debt free. Why? Because I planned it for them. Plan. Put your hand in the hand of God and start doing some planning. Start doing some dreaming. Hallelujah. I've got a dream. Amen. Dr. Martin Luther wasn't the only one that had a dream, Dr. Martin Luther King. I've got a dream too. Hallelujah. You should have a dream. And that dream will come true if you work toward it. Amen. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your father and your mother. I was sick. They cut me open. And I couldn't get up hardly. My wife knows. And I was looking up at the ceiling, and I said, God, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment we promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. I said, God, you promised me that if I'd honor my parents, things would go well with me. Who wants to live a long life if they don't have strength? God, I thank you. I honor my parents, and you're going to honor your word, and I thank you for healing me. I tell you, it's a great thing when you can talk to God like that. That, God, I've kept your word. I've done what you said. I've, I've yielded my life to you. I've come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, God, I thank you for healing me. See, if our hearts doesn't condemn us, the Bible says we have confidence toward God. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Get into the book. Stay in the church. Stay connected with people of like precious faith. Dream your dreams and go after it. Hallelujah. And watch God work in your life. Honor your father and your mother. Then the Bible talks about the wives. It says, wives, love your husband. Honor your husband. Submit yourself to your husband. Be a helper and not a hinderer. Be a helper. Help that man. God knows we need help. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I tell people, if I, if I didn't have my wife, Teresa, I wouldn't pass the church if God would let me out of it. I say, God, please let me out. I'd rather be an evangelist and just go. But see, she keeps me balanced. She's a pastor's wife. God gave me a gift of a pastor's wife. I look at some pastors. They don't have a pastor's wife. They don't have a woman to get in and work. They, they don't have a woman that's there beside them and, and giving them counsel and godly instructions at times when, when we need it. Amen. I need it. I know I need it. You know I need it. But that's all right. I got a godly wife to help me. Hallelujah. Protect your marriage is what I'm saying. Your marriage is a gift from God. The wife is to do her part and to make her house a home. A lot of the things, the lessons I learned, I learned as a child. We didn't have a whole lot. I remember getting in that car and we just about curl our toes up hoping we could make it up the hill sometime. <laughs> but we'd ride through those beautiful homes in our city, mansions over there on Country Club Drive. And my mother would say, sweetheart, talking to my dad, I wonder how many of those houses or homes. That stuck with me. We had love. We didn't have the stuff. But you know God has been good. And now the stuff has shown up. The stuff has shown up in your life. Everybody's got some stuff, you know. Amen. And, and we're so blessed now. But don't forget the blesser. God your home, God your marriage, God your relationship with the Father. And in this message, I, I really want to speak to men tonight because God puts this responsibility on them for the home. God says the man is the head of the family. And a godly man will lead his family in the ways of the Lord. See, the man is to work. We live in a culture where it's all right for women to work. You know, I have an accounting background. I do all the business. But if I didn't have giftings in that area, I would let my wife do it if she had that gifting. Amen. But I would never give away my responsibility. So you can delegate things, but you can never, man, as a man, you can never give away your responsibility for your headship. You are in charge. God did it 
God made it like that. He holds you responsible. It doesn't mean that you're a tyrant. It means that you love your wife and you love your family as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. This will help you. This is real, everyday living. As they say at Firestone, this is where the rubber meets the road. They used to say that. It was years and years ago. But the Bible, you know, said to teach your children through godly examples. If the Bible says it's right, then it's right. If the Bible says something is wrong, then it's wrong. So let your children, let them learn through your godly example. Because the Bible says, men, you are to bring your children up as the head of that home in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. If you want to find out who the head really is in your home, I can tell you how to do it. I can tell you who's in charge. When trouble shows up, you'll find out who the head of the family is real quick. I'll never forget, Teresa, we hadn't been married very long, and all of a sudden, we heard a noise downstairs. She said, Jerry, get up. There's somebody downstairs. Go take care of that. She sent me on a mission, amen. So I found out that night who really was in charge, amen. See, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, when trouble shows up, you get to be the head real quick. But God put that order there because that will come decisions in your life. It doesn't mean that one person is superior to the other. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means God has a divine order. That there will come decisions when you will not agree 100%. And when that happens, somebody has to make that decision. And the man is the one that God says, make that decision. You love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I've even preached it from this pulpit. I told my wife one day, I said, it's my responsibility to make this decision. I said, and if I'm wrong, I'm still right because it's my responsibility to make the decision. And if I'm wrong, please pray for me because I need help. <laughs> but it's my decision. It, there comes a time when somebody has to make that decision. I'll never forget, I never heard my mother and dad argue at all. Never, never, never. Now, I can't say that about my wife and myself. I wish that I could, but I cannot. But my parents, I never saw them argue. And I would tell my mother, I said, Mother, he's wrong. He's wrong, and I know he's wrong. And she would look at me, and she'd say, Well, son, he's a good man, and he'll come around. I said, why do you give in to him like that? She said, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down <clears throat> on your raft. And I'm going to make sure that when the sun goes down in my home, that there's peace and everything is in order. Now, when you come up in a family like that, it helps you to understand divine order. Thank God for my Christian home. Amen. You know, <clears throat> we've got all kind of books that people have written on how to rear and how to discipline your children. I'll never forget when I was in college and I was studying psychology. I had a psychology teacher that talked about not punishing children and not correcting them, that you're just negatively reinforcing them, and you're encouraging that behavior by correcting them. Well, one day that professor and her husband and her children they came into the grocery store where I worked. I was working my way through college on the GI Bill, and I thought they were going to tear that place all to pieces. I said, dear God in heaven, you know, they're about to tear this place up. She nor her husband corrected them. Don't raise your voice. Don't punish them. Don't whip them. Put them in time out. That's ignorance. And as a result of teaching like that, we've got a generation of kids that have gone wild, and they have absolutely no respect for authority. What we need to do as a society is we need to throw out all those books, and we need to put in the book. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes a child just needs a good whipping. It won't kill them. I'm not talking about abusing them. I'm talking about discipline, 
Children need to be corrected. And when they do wrong, they need to be corrected. And it needs to come from the father, the daddy in the home. Children are a heritage from the Lord. They must be taught. They must be corrected. Amen. Like my daddy used to correct me. He would put the board of education to the seat of understanding. Amen. He was telling me, he said, son, this hurts me a whole lot more than you do. I didn't understand that. I'm the one fixing to get this whipping. Amen. And then I had my own parents. And I would tell them, daddy doesn't want to do this, but daddy has to correct you. Why would I do that? Because of my Christian home. And, and look at this, Proverbs 13, 24. Listen to what the word of God has to say. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him many times. Proverbs 22 and 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Look at Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive him far from it. Far from what? Far from his foolishness. I mean, this is just practical preaching proverbs 23 13 withhold not correction from thy child if thou beatest him with the rod he shall not die thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell that doesn't mean to abuse him it means to correct him proverbs 29 15 the rod and reproof giveth wisdom Woo! i got i ought to be the smartest guy on the planet but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Men, take care of your families. Take care of your children. Correct them and discipline them and lead them by godly example. Today, my children are all grown and gone. I started to bring a plaque that my son wrote. He couldn't understand some of my correction until he got his own children and some people think I'm harsh they really do parents they're not Bible based matter of fact they think in my son's family there they think he's harsh but he isn't he's a good daddy I got this from Jessica my youngest on past appreciation day <clears throat> this year thank you for always giving me guidance in life Showing me what it means to walk with the Lord daily. And for helping me to understand why God made daddies first. We love and appreciate you. Wish we were there to celebrate with you. I've got a plaque that my wife, <clears throat> she framed it for me. And when I come down, I, I read it. It's something my son wrote to me. But I said, why do I have to do this? Why? I said, because I say so. And that's why God made that as first. Because you don't understand yet. We got a generation where people, unfortunately, they decide what church they're going to go to by what church their children want to go to. That's crazy. Get in a church where the Spirit of God is moving. Get that where you're getting knowledge and understanding and and. You know, a place where the Holy Spirit is moving. Look at Ephesians 5.25. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. See, the husband, he is to love his wife. He is to take care of his family. He is to bear the heavy load. The husband is to be the priest or the pastor in his home. The marriage relationship is compared to Jesus Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 25, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I want to ask you a question. Men, do you want your prayers to be answered? When you get on your knees or when you're talking to the Heavenly Father, do you want your prayers to be answered. Women, do you want your husband's prayers to be answered? I'm going to give you one verse of Scripture. 1 Peter 3 and 7. 1 Peter 3 and 7. Likewise, ye husband, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give an honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel, 
being asked together the grace of life, look at this, that your prayers be not hindered. When I saw that verse, I began to understand why there's such a diabolical attack on the family, why husbands and wives can't get along at times, why others bring things into the family to bring confusion. See, the devil destroyed the first family. He destroyed the first home. Jesus, the last Adam, he came, he turned the water into wine, put in his approval on the family and on the marriage. Then Peter comes along, look at this. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, with your wife, according to knowledge, given honor unto thy wife as the weaker vessel, being asked together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. That is a powerful verse of Scripture, Brother Clark. When I saw that years ago, I began to understand that in my headship, there were times that I had to be submissive, never give up my position of headship, but I had to be submissive, and I had to bring peace, and I had to bring tranquility into my marriage. Because if I did not do that, I realized my prayers would be hindered. And I don't want my prayers hindered. I don't want nothing here to hinder me. I want to be able to talk to my Father based on the Lordship of Jesus Christ and based on the fact that I'm living according to His divine plan for my family and for my home, for my wife, and for my children, now for grandchildren. And this is just practical preaching. This is just to help you to understand there is a, an attack going on in this world against the family. Jesus Christ is not the dictator of the church. Jesus did not ignore his church. Jesus did not refuse to talk to his church. Jesus did not refuse to forgive his church. Jesus loves the church. And Jesus gave himself for it. And men, we must love our homes and our families. And as real men, godly men, we have to give ourselves to our family and to our home. Let us stand.